Second Peter chapter 2, we will be looking actually at verses 12 through 17. An observation that I made as I was reading through these verses several times, the Lord just kind of gave me this visual, and it's pretty graphic, and I think you'll, you'll get it as soon as I say it, but a body without a head is dead. If you can imagine a body without a head, it pretty much just falls over and, and dies. I actually did some research. I wanted to, to get an idea of what that entails, having a body without a head. And as I was doing some research, it's pretty interesting how there are actually experiments out there taking bodies of animals and, and severing their heads and then trying to see which part survives longer. Uh, it, it, it was difficult for the body to survive. It was more easy for the head to survive. And, and they did all kinds of things with the heads, like, like transplanting the heads onto other animals and connecting all the, the main arteries and, and, and vessels and, and, and nerve endings and so forth. And, and the head survived. In fact, if you leave both together side by side, uh, the head would last longer than, than the body itself. And so... A body without a head is dead. Now, why do I say that? Why do I say that? Because we are the body of Christ, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians eleven three, And he, Christ, is our head. And if we're severed from Christ, then we're dead. We're dead. What a picture. If you're living your life according to your idea of God, you're dead. We need to be connected to Christ and we need to live according to his word as he has spoken it through the scriptures. And what we have here today, and as we continue on from verses 9 through 11, as we saw last week, that these men were presumptuous, self-willed, and were not afraid to even speak of dignitaries. And as they continue on, we understand that these men are animals without reason. And that is our theme this morning. Understand this, because as I was reading through this, I thought to myself, well, well, Lord, what do you want to teach us as a body of Christ? Yeah, we we know there are people out there that are taking advantage of other people. We know that. It happens all the time. Uh, But we have to be aware of that. We have to protect ourselves. We have to understand it. We have to protect our loved ones. We have to protect our churches, especially the churches, because there are people out there in the name of Christ, who are professing to know him and teach his truth, and they always go back to the word. We just want to stick with the word, but in, in reality, they're teaching their own idea of God. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen: For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Satan has the ability to transform himself into a good person. The ability to come off as, as someone who's trustworthy. As an angel of light, I can depend on that person. But in reality, underneath the light is Satan himself. That's a scary thought if you're not aware of Satan's tactics. He goes on and says in verse 15, Therefore, so in light of this truth, knowing that Satan can do this, he has that ability, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. The message uh, interpretates this as, so it should surprise no one when his servants masquerade as servants of God. And so if Satan can do it, then so can his ministers. And there are ministers today that are masquerading as godly men, and yet they are manipulating and twisting the scriptures for their own selfish reasons. And Peter here will now describe those reasons in these verses here. So as we go through this, I think that we will be surprised at what really takes place in the heart of men who are ministers of Satan. We can also glean from this, and I want you to understand this, we can also glean from this that sometimes we have that capability of having the same heart, especially in the day and age that we live today. There are some struggles that we have, personal sins that we need to deal with, things that we need to ask God to help us to remove from our lives so that we can walk with him in righteousness. So let's look at verse 12. But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of things they do not understand and will utterly perish 
in their own corruption. So what a description here of these men. They're, they're like natural. They're governed by their, their nature, their instinct, their born animal instinct that's within them, that sinful nature, and that's what runs their life. That is what governs their life, their yearnings, their, their hungers, their thirst. I've got to have that, and I will stop at nothing to get it. I will run over whoever it is in my way, and, and I want it, I'll grab it, and I'll take it. And that's what these men are like. They're brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, Peter said. So these false teachers are like animals. They're without a moral compass, and they're like dogs, dogs who just roam the streets causing problems, falling into mischiefs and struggles and situations. Someone said this, sin will take you further than you ever intended to stray. It will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. It will cost you more than you ever dreamed you would pay. That's sin. The Bible's clear that the wages of sin is death. And you think you can get away with sin, you can't get away with sin. You think you can taste sin, but it it goes deeper than just tasting, you have to swallow. You think you can get away with that sin, but you can't because it will grab you and take you in. And it will destroy you as it will destroy these men. Because what Peter is saying is that these men are like predatory animals which men deliberately snare in order to destroy them because they are beasts that are causing destructions and so he says that they speak evil of things that they do not understand now that's an interesting statement there interesting statement they speak of things that they don't understand now of course peter's talking about the word of god about god himself the messiah jesus christ christianity uh maybe the beginning of christianity how it all got started the work of the holy spirit there's a lack of understanding there in their eyes and so they're making up as they go that they will meet their own selfish needs there They continually slander and rail against that which they have no knowledge. And the Greek suggests it's in a continual sense. In other words, they're practicing this. They don't know any other way because they don't know the truth. And so they continue to live in arrogance. There was a great denomination, and it was known for preaching on justification. Now, some of you might not know what that is. Uh, We've taught it here before in the past what justification is, but this church was known for preaching it. They they shared on it, if not every Sunday morning, what justification is. Justification basically is this, is that we are justified by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and that is it. We're accepted by God by the work of Jesus Christ and nothing else, not by our works at all, just as though we never sin, yet we're sinners and we fall short of God's glory and we can never measure up, do enough good works, give enough money, You know, to ever measure up to God that he would say, oh, you're acceptable to me. No. Now, it doesn't disqualify us as human beings and compassionate and loving. No, it only says that our nature is sinful. And so what did God have to do? He had to send his son. And his son bore our sins and took the penalty of sins and thus justified us in his presence. But this church was known for this for many years. Well, they did a survey and they found that only 40% of their members believed that they were saved by their works. 40% of their members believed that they were saved by their works. So they didn't understand it. They did not understand justification. Now, how many do you believe here that you are saved by your works? I would say not many. How many of you believe that your salvation is maintained by your works? I would say a higher number. Because we feel that way at times. If I'm not working, then I must not be saved. And that's not true because that justification is until the day of redemption, until we go home to be with the Lord. So what does this say? It says that understanding is very important, isn't it? Understanding truth is very important. I think that's one of the number one complaints in marriage is communication and understanding what the other person is saying. I have found in the ministry that the number one struggle with ministry is communication. What are you really saying? I have argued with other men about a situation, and after hours of arguing, we realize we're saying the same thing, but in a different way. It's just amazing if we just stop and really talk about it and, and try to understand what is being said, we'll, we'll come out with the understanding of the truth. And so understanding is very important in our lives. We need to understand, especially the word of God, the truth. 
at the Summerfest um, this past Friday, we had concert night. So there was a young lady who did worship, and then after she did this amazing worship, then came uh, the Stan, our youth group here, and did a lot of old skillet songs for us. And there was this one individual, this young a middle-aged man, and he was standing there, and the whole time uh, he stood there listening to the, to the music, and he literally just stood there like this, just listening the whole time. And, and then Pat uh, came up and shared her testimony in Spanish, and this man knew Spanish, and he stood there and he listened to the whole thing. And then I got up and shared a couple of minutes uh, in English, and he listened to the whole thing. And when it was over, Pastor Rawl of the Refuge Bible Fellowship happened to be walking by, and he saw him intensely listening to us. And so he just kind of asked him, how are you doing? Did you hear what was said? And he says, yeah, did you understand it? And the guy said, no, I didn't understand it. And, and, and so understanding is so important. And so he began to explain it a little bit more simply uh, to him. Uh, explain to him what Jesus did and so forth. And, and in fact, the guy kind of reached down into his, his shirt and he pulled out the rosary, you know, with a little cross and Jesus hanging on just to, just to let him know, well, I'm Catholic, you know. And so he's getting an understanding. Uh, I just unbuttoned my shirt, sorry. <laughs> he's getting an understanding of, of what he's saying there, you know, and then all of a sudden he understood why Jesus came. And he ended up accepting the Lord Jesus Christ into his heart. So how important is understanding? Well, this man entered into the kingdom of heaven and the angels were rejoicing because he finally understood. And so understanding is important. If you don't understand doctrine, you can always ask. Always ask and you can always pray and ask the Lord to reveal that doctrine to you. I know with new believers, because there may be some new believers here, that oftentimes you pick up the word of God and, and you'll start to read it in Genesis, usually Genesis, and, and you're reading it and you're going, okay, I understand that. And now you get to Leviticus and you're going, I don't understand this. <laughs> what are they talking about? All right, forget it. I'm just going to put it back on the shelf, you know? And it's, it's difficult. I know of uh, relatives who we have led to the Lord and, and after uh, discipling them to a certain extent, you know, they're reading the New Testament and they're like, I don't understand this. And there are times when we're not illuminated to the scriptures because we're truly not saved yet. The Spirit of God hasn't entered into us and we haven't prayed for the understanding of the scriptures through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we really need to pray. And so I really believe that understanding uh, really comes from being on your knees and praying and seeking God. As you're reading and asking God, Show me what you're saying here. Tell me within the context that I may understand your word, that I may apply it to my life, that I may live a righteous life and know who you are. We need to understand. These men did not understand, and so they only lived by their instincts, by what they believed to be true. When we come to church, we need to come to church with the attitude of what? Well, worship, right? Obviously of worship. We're worshiping God. We're, we're not worshiping, I hope you're not coming here because of me. Now, how do I know if you're coming here because of me? How do we know if we're coming? Because if, if I offend you, if I say something that you don't like, you'll leave. That's because you're coming here because of me. Really. Think about that one for a little bit. If you're coming here for God, then you will understand that I'm not perfect. And I'm going to make mistakes. I'm not going to always be there, you know. You're going to understand that. But the truth is going out, and and you want to come and worship God because you're here for Him. You're going to give for Him. You're going to serve for Him. You're going to love Him, and that's why you're here, for Him and Him alone. Now, yes, understanding the Word is important, and, and you need to have a pastor that is teaching from the Word of God. And so we have to come to church expecting to learn also expecting to learn not to pay our debt of sitting in the boring service you know but to come and say okay lord what are you going to teach me today and i find that the most profound messages are the most simplest messages you can be a chuck missler and it just goes over your head and i've i've heard him teach and it just goes over my head i just don't get what he's saying because he's just so in depth but when he gets simple and it's very simple, boy, it's just profound. And so sometimes we need to keep it easy. We need to understand the simplicity of the word of God. And as Calvary Chapel's model is lately, is simply teaching the Bible simply. Yeah. 
so that we understand it. But we're here to learn. We're here to understand who God is. We're here to get a piece of him and get connected to him and know who he is so that we can share it with others, so that we can live by the word of God and we can grow by the word of God. That's our purpose for being here. But these men, they'll utterly perish, Peter says, in their own corruption. Look at verse 13. And will receive wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deception while they feast with you. And that's an interesting uh, phrase there, while they feast with you. These are talking about agape feasts, just like we have on uh, uh, once a month here at the end of the month, and we get together and people bring their food and, uh, and, and they eat one with another. Back then they did the same thing. They had these feasts, and the rich and the poor, and this was one way that they provided for the poor, because those that were wealthy and were able to provide these pot blessings, we call them, uh, and bring them to church, then the poor would come in, and they'd also be able to eat too, and we do the same thing here. And these men would sit within these feasts, and they were sitting there for a purpose, to only fill their own bellies with their, their own instincts and pleasures, Peter says they're receiving wages, and then that wages in the Greek suggests that it's a continual wage that's coming upon them and leading up to total destruction because of their unrighteousness and their pleasures. That word pleasure there is not necessarily material pleasure or even social pleasure or status pleasure, but it's more sensual pleasure. These false teachers were flaunting their sinful lifestyles in the name of liberty, in the name of liberty. They would go around and say, well, I have liberty in Christ, and so I can literally do that. Uh, we see that today in, in the churches. Uh, one of the things that the churches are trying to do is be relevant, and so you'll, you'll hear of churches called relevant you know, uh, today, uh, trying to reach the culture, and so they're trying to be relevant by becoming like the culture. And so they will literally have, have agape feasts with alcohol, and just to let the culture know, we can drink as long as we don't get drunk. And so they'll all sit out there and they'll have their beers. You know, I've heard of churches will literally bring out their beers and say, hey, let's toast, you know, right there in church to be relevant. And so they do it openly with, with, without any conviction whatsoever that they might stumble someone else. Because the Bible's clear that if we stumble another brother with our liberties, it becomes sin, and it may destroy that brother if we don't have the maturity to understand and see there are things that we keep within our own home. There are things that we don't do out and open because it may stumble other people. But they think they have this liberty. And Peter focuses on the sensual lifestyle of these false teachers that originates from their sensual thought life, which is driven by their animal, animal instinct to gratify self without regards for the effect or impact on anyone else but themselves. These evil men think. They think, and that Greek word is the present tense, they continually think this way about their desires and come to the conclusion that it is right for them to live, to have pleasure, and not just in the night, but also in broad daylight. They literally think about this all day long. And they reason it in their own mind, not through scriptures because they have no understanding of scriptures. And so in their own minds, what's so wrong about this? I'm just having a beer. Don't judge me. And they use all these words and they feel I'm justified to live this way. And so they'll receive their wages. Phillips puts it this way. Their wickedness has earned them an evil end and they will be paid in full for their sinfulness. Even the children's Bible, the international children's Bible puts it this way. They have caused many people to suffer, so they themselves will suffer that their pay for what they have done. So very clear. There are consequences, right, for what we do. We understand that cause and effect. The wages of sins is death. You know, whatever a man sows into the ground, he'll reap. Whatever a man sows spiritually, he'll also reap. Whatever a woman sows spiritually, she will also reap. There are consequences. It was Eric, the actor Eric Roberts. You know who Eric Roberts is? He's a famous actor. Uh, kind of B-type actor. Didn't really make it to the very top. Uh, interesting movies, a lot of gangster type of movies. He's a brother of Julia Roberts. Um, he came out and just said that W. Bush is responsible for the beheading of James Foley. He's an actor. He just wants to let everybody know that it wasn't 
Isa that beheaded James Foley. It was W. Bush that beheaded James Foley. And this is what he said. He is forgotten. He is a forgotten president. As we forget and block severe trauma, and then he says, Obama stands for compassion. (laughs) Talk about a messed up thought process. Talk about reason. Talk about not understanding. He, uh, He has no idea of consequences, right? He has no idea that these men who beheaded fully are responsible for what they did. Just like we are responsible for what we do. We cannot blame everyone else for our actions. The wages of sin is death. What we sow, we reap. And so when we use those lines, you know, like, God, it's the woman you gave me. It's not my fault. You know, of course, we're blaming God. Well, no, I'm blaming the woman. No, by blaming God for the woman, you're blaming God. And ultimately, we're blaming God. We can't play those games. We need to be honest. You won't get healed. You won't have forgiveness. You won't grow until you're honest with yourself and who you are and your sinful nature, and be honest with God, and then let God have it, and then let God take it, and then grow through it, mature in those things. Peter goes on and says, their spots, their blemishes, carousing in their own deception while they feast with you. Their their dirty spots and scabs is what he's basically saying there. Uh, these are men guilty of more than just false teaching and promoting evil pleasures. They are actually guilty of leading others astray. He says in verse 14, to, to get even deeper in his description of them, they're having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. Accursed children. Now, that's an interesting phrase here that Peter uses in verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery, unfaithful to their marriage vows. These are prophets and teachers who stand behind a pulpit and they teach the word of God and yet their eyes are full of adultery. Now, the Greek here literally says that they continually have eyes full of adultery. And, And so it's talking about the fact that That's all they're literally thinking about. They're looking for opportunities to commit adultery. And so they're watching the women as they come to church, hoping that there's a mutual consent to have some sensual relationship because that's constantly on their minds. They can't think of anything else because they're merely animals trying to fulfill their sinful nature and their instincts of sexuality one commentator mayor said vivid picture of man who cannot see a woman without lascivious thoughts towards her and so it's almost uncontrollable it's not that he necessarily is looking though he's looking but it's in the sense that he can't even control it because it's become his very nature Years ago, when I was a young believer, there was a controversy going on with one of these faith healer teachers. <clears throat> uh, I believe it was Jimmy Swaggart who was caught in a relationship, and it became big news because it was within the Christian community. And so there was repentance, he was crying, he was weeping, you know, the church was devastated, but they forgave him, they tried to restore him and so forth, and then shortly Shortly after, he was on his way to Palm Springs, I believe, and they pulled him over for speeding or something, and they found all this pornography in his, in his car, and all over in the, uh, on the dashboards and the seats and, you know, and so forth. And again, so the repentance and the crying were all just you know, um, signs you know, of a, a false repentance, of sorrows that did not lead to repentance, as, as Paul puts it in Corinthians. And we've seen those type of things happen over and over. And those type of things can devastate a Christian. Many Christians were devastated by that. And I think over the years, as we have seen those type of things, I think that's why the church has become weaker and weaker and weaker. And that men do not trust the pastors, even recently within Calvary Chapel. uh, In that church in, in Florida. Now, thank God that they were able to handle it very well. And work through it and remove them and 
find restoration, but not restoration back to the church. I, I doubt if that's probably going to happen. If it does, it won't be for many, many, many years. You know, but there's a way of handling that correctly. And true repentance needs to take place. But these men, <clears throat> it's their instinct. They can't even control it. And Jesus told us in Matthew 6, 23, the lamp of the body is the eye. It's the eye. If therefore your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, this applies to us. We were at a pastor's conference a couple of years ago, and it was uh, Josh... um, wrote uh, a lot of these little handbooks on how to share your faith and so forth. I can't, his last name fades away right now. McDowell. He, he mentioned that 40%, and he's speaking to pastors, 40% of you pastors have looked at pornography. 40%. Today, the world understands that more and more, the world... The culture is dealing with pornography because it's so available now because of computers. And so people are diving into it because you don't have to go to the store. It's right there on your computer. And so there are programs you can buy to block these things, but you can always get around those things. There's accountability uh, programs where you can be accountable to others, but there's always that opportunity to fall into those type of things. We need to be careful of those things. We, we need to understand that that stuff will destroy. It will destroy us. And it will come into the church. And we will see it. Several years ago, probably about eight years ago, a young lady came into church. And not just men, but also ladies. A young lady came into the church. And very nice lady. Uh, she was... Average looking, she, she wasn't ugly, she was okay. <laughs> but she came in befriending everybody, befriending all the ladies, and all of a sudden she was asking the guys out on dates. How'd you like to go on a date? And, and so she, she would go to one and spend time and talk and ask for prayer and you know, just really try to connect. And next thing it was, hey, how'd you like to go on a date? And she was trying to hook up. And so that person was there, you know, I really don't want to go on a date, you know, and I'm not ready for that right now and sit her down. Okay, she understands. And then she'd find another guy within the church and start connecting and hooking up, you know. And then finally we just said, you know, this has got to stop. That's not why we're coming here. You know, we're not coming here to hook up. You know, we're not coming here to find our, our spouse. We're coming here to worship God. Now, if that happens within that process in a natural way without you really seeking or looking at and, and purposing for that, I understand that. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen because it does happen. But not with the purpose of coming to church. And eventually she hooked up with uh, someone that, that uh, came to church uh, who had a brother that she hooked up with and then eventually he realized that something was wrong with this girl. <laughs> you know, she just wanted to get married you know, quickly. And there are guys that come in. And you can tell when these guys are coming in because that's the first thing they're looking at because their eyes are wandering and seeing. I feel sorry for the young ladies who come in who are single for the first time. I can, I can see the, b- them being uncomfortable because we don't have a lot of single young ladies here. You know? It could be very uncomfortable. And we need to be careful of those things. We need to understand and, and know that this isn't proper. It's inappropriate for church. We're here to worship the Lord. We're here to give him glory and honor and praise. Uh, these men didn't care, though. They, they didn't wait in the night. They did it openly in the morning. You know, they were going like this up and down. Oh, yeah, I like her. Oh, yeah, I like her. Oh, yeah, I like her. You know, and they didn't care if others were seeing them. You know, they would justify it uh, with others, or others just closed their eyes and said, oh, I didn't see that, you know, type of thing. Peter goes on and says that they cannot cease from sin, enticing even to unstable souls. He goes on and gives an example of the love of money of these men. In verse 15, he talks about Balaam. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray. Now, that phrase, forsaken the right way, well, what's the right way? Well, what does the word of God say 
about the right way. That's the way that they have forsaken. They're not interested in reading the word or studying or finding the way. They are just making up their way. So they have forsaken that right way and they have gone astray. So not going God's way is going astray from God. Be careful of that. Following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now, so here's another example, uh, an example of the Old Testament, Balaam, who had forsaken the right way. Uh, God had told him the right way several times, but he had pushed his way, and so God finally gave in and says, go ahead and, and go your own way. And he'd gone astray from God's way. And so these false teachers had abandoned the truth and righteous beliefs, the way, resulting in an unrighteous life. Now, you can, you can read about Balaam in the Old Testament, and I encourage you to do so. He's found in the book of Numbers 22 through 24. And it's a good read. It's a good story because there's, there's so much there. And it really challenges your faith when you first read it. I don't know if you've read it or not. But it's literally a donkey who speaks to Balaam, literally begins to speak with, a, with an audible voice and with intelligence. And so here's a mule, a donkey, who we consider to be dumb because, you know, usually when you get in trouble and you're a little kid, you're a donkey. You know, my, I would get called a, a burro. You know, you're just a donkey. You don't, you're not listening. You're not learning, you know, and so forth. And yet here's this donkey, and he's so intelligent uh, that, that God uses him to warn Balaam because he has forsaken the way and gone astray. He wasn't obedient to what God had said. He's followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of righteousness. Now, Peter here is using his fourth illustration in the Old Testament. Uh, we saw Noah, we saw Lot, you know, we saw the angels, and now we see Balaam, a prophet of God, uh, a man who followed God and when it came to wages, he was willing to not follow God and seek after these wages. It says in verse 16, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. So can God use donkeys? He's using me. You know, that scripture has been so encouraging to me from time to time. I just fall back to that at times because there are times where I just wonder, God, how can you even use me? I used a donkey <laughs> so I could use you. And, and then truly, I'm saying this from my heart, sometimes that has, only, that has been the only thing keeping me going because sometimes I feel like I'm a donkey. <laughs> you know? But if anything good comes out of this mouth, it's because of God because he has put it there. Now, interesting story. We have this man, Balaam, who serves the Lord. And you have about a million Israelites who were headed towards um, Balak, a king there, who had saw that, that God had deli delivered Israel from Shehon and Gog, uh, the king there. And so he started to worry. He was very concerned. And so what he thought to do was to go and hire Balaam to come and curse the children of Israel. And so he sent an embassy over and, and asked Balaam, would you, uh, would you go come and, and curse Israel? And he said, let me pray. Good thing, go pray first. Let's see what the Lord says. And the Lord says, no, don't go. You know, I don't want you going. And so he came back and says, no, I, I can't go. God says, no, I don't want you to go. And so Balak again said, okay, let me send a, a, a greater embassy a richer one, I'll come back and look, we're willing to give you this and that. What do you think about coming over and cursing Israel? Let me pray. Again, he prayed and the Lord says, no, I don't want you going. You, know, you can't go. And Balaam says, look, God says, no, I can't go. And even if you give me a house full of gold, hint, 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 I mean, a lot of gold, the closets and the rooms, everywhere, just filled. Even if you gave me all that, hint, hint, I won't go. So Balak came back and said, hey, we'll offer you a house full of gold. Oh, really? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> he loved the wages of sin. And so the Lord says, okay, I want you to go, but I don't want you to curse them. Do not say anything that I don't tell you to say. And on his way over there, an angel was in this path that he was taking in narrow, uh, narrow rocks. Some believe that that angel was Jesus Christ pre-incarnate, 
We don't know, but some suggest that could have been. And this angel was ready to kill Balaam. And so here's this donkey coming along, and the donkey sees the angel. And he immediately stops and pushes Balaam up against the rock. And Balaam's like hitting the donkey. Come on, you dumb mule. Come on, you dumb mule. Who's really the donkey here? And so finally, after several times, the donkey's just like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? And he starts to speak to him concerning the angel that's in the path ready to destroy him. And, you know, now that's not the funny part. The funny part is that Balaam starts talking back to the donkey. You know, he says, well, why aren't you moving? Why aren't you moving? And so in a sense, this donkey uh, saves the life of Balaam. Now, is that a true story? That's, that's the question that some of us may ask. Uh, it's kind of a remarkable story when you think about it. Do donkeys talk? I mean, that would be a message to give. Do donkeys talk? Yeah, look at the, our government. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> is it a true story? I believe that it is. Does God have that ability? Well, wait a minute. In our human wisdom, we know donkeys don't talk. We know that's impossible. We know it's impossible for the whole earth to be flooded. We know it's impossible for plagues to come like that. We know it's impossible for a man to walk on water. We know those things are impossible. And that's what makes God possible, is that he can do the impossible because he's God. If we can explain God, then he ain't God at all. See, it's when we can't explain God and the work of God that we know there is a God. Can God put vocal cords in the donkey? Of course he can, because God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe Genesis chapter 1, you believe everything else. I mean, if God can just out of nothing create everything, then boy, he can do anything. Now, Peter here justifies the text in the Old Testament in Numbers. And he's saying that these men are like Balaam after money. Here's Balaam after money, and a, a dumb donkey begins in a Speak to him in a voice. And so Peter is saying, yeah, that's a true story. It happened. And now it's an example to us today about these false teachers who are just after resources. Again, we we talked about that at length last time, how they just want to take as much resources from you as, as possible. Peter goes on and says, these are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So he paints a, a pretty good picture here about these false prophets here, how they're clouds. And of course, clouds have a promise of rain, but yet there's no rain. It's just a promise. When I was working for Southern California Edison, we had a a manager who ran the department, and he would come in and sit with us. This was during the time of deregulation, if you remember that, when everything was being deregulated. It went through the phone company, the gas company, and now it was hitting the electric company. And so deregulation, everybody was careful. We went to downsizing. People were losing their jobs. People going into management and so forth. And, and so this manager came in and he would sit on the table and, you know, cross his legs and he'd just tell the guy, I, I want you guys to know I love you. I love you all. I just want you to know that I love you and I am doing as much as I can to keep your jobs. You need to know this. I'm not worried about my job. I'm here for you. I'm worried about your jobs and I am going to cut back as much as I can so that you have jobs because I know you have families. I know that you love them. You need to provide for them. And so I love you guys. And he did this for a good six months. And because of deregulation, he saw an opportunity to start his own business doing exactly what we do. And so what he did was in those six months, he began to collect all the schematics, all the manuals, all the equipment that he could, all the devices that he could, and he was storing them up in his his little cave there and getting ready to stab us all in the back after telling us he loved us, he loved us, he loved us. And then all of a sudden, boom, he left. And as he left, the guys that were being fired, see Edison, they don't care about you. Remember, I'm the one that loves you. Come work for me. And they started working for him. And so he built this great big uh, company out of the deregulation that did what we did because nobody else did what we did. We tested and calibrated the, the meters on homes and the big industries to make sure they were accurate. No one else did that. There's no schooling out there to train anyone to do something like that. It was all in-house. 
And he knew that. And so now he had that expertise, he had that company, and he's able to glean. So he just built it up. And of course, the whole purpose and plan was to build it up enough to make it worth something and then sell it off and make your millions. And that's how some of these guys do that. And, and, and so this guy, he was a cloud with all these promises, with all this emotion of love. But in the end, there was really nothing, nothing there. Be careful when you have people like that. The people that are always promising you, telling, telling you, I love you, I care about you, I'll be there for you, you know, be careful. Now, I know I've been, I've been accused sometimes of not being emotional, not being caring enough, you know. And it's one of the reasons is because I don't want to say things that I can't fulfill, <laughs> you know, I can't really be. You know, I love you, I'll be there for you. I can't always be there for you. Not when you have 175 people that are pulling you in all of the directions, and then you still have to study for two messages a week. It's just very difficult. I'm not making, I'm not making up excuses. I, I do the best that I can, but it's hard for me to make promises knowing that I can't keep those promises. So I'd rather not make those promises. You know? These men don't do that. They'll make you all kinds of promises, and you walk away with feeling good about yourself, feeling good about the place, feeling good about supporting them. But then when it really comes down to it, boom. You know, they don't deliver it to nobody because it's only about themselves and gaining their own resources. And Peter says that it's reserved for them the blackness of darkness forever. So that is a thick, dense darkness for those that are misusing God's truth for lack of understanding and only fulfilling their own sinful lusts. Let me close. False teachers have one thing on their mind and that one thing will lead them into outer darkness. Be careful of who you're listening to. Be careful of who you believe. Yeah, they always mix in a little bit of truth, but there's a lie. You know, rat poison is 99% food. There's only 1% poison in there that kills and so even if a false teacher gives you a lot of good wisdom and understanding, be careful of that 1% that will eventually kill you.